In this lecture, we will be talking about different types of tissues and different organ systems. So all tissues, all tissues consist of cells. There are four types of tissues. It's epithelial tissue, shown right here, which covers the, the surfaces, uh, forms a barrier, lines the cavities and passages like respiratory passages and, and uh, intestines and forms glands. There's a connective tissue which you can guess from the name connects, it binds different organs and cells, protects and supports the body. There's a muscle tissue which function is to move, okay, it can be excited, can respond to stimulus and then contract to move the body. And then there's nervous tissue, which also can be excited. Nervous tissue allows for um, a communication between the different body parts. So let's talk about epithelial tissue first. It can be classified first based on the number of layers. If there's only one layer, epithelial tissue is called simple. If there are multiple layers, epithelial tissue is called stratified. Epithelial tissue can also be classified based on the shape of the cells. If cells are flat, the tissue is called squamous. They are cube-like. Cells are called cuboidal. And if they are column-like, these are called columnar. Combining the classification by number of layers and classification by shape, we can get something like simple cuboidal or stratified squamous epithelium. <clears throat> so epithelial tissue, interestingly enough, is the only tissue that is not vascularized. It does not have blood vessels. So let's talk about different types of epithelia. We're going to start with a simple squamous epithelium. It is not a huge barrier, so it can be found in the places where there is a lot of diffusion or filtration, secretion of the lubricating substances. You can find it in the lungs, so diffusion, uh, blood vessels, again diffusion, lymphatic vessels, uh, diffusion. You can find it in kidneys, that's filtration. Simple cuboidal epithelium is responsible for secretion and absorption and can be found in the places where secretion and absorption are particularly intense, like glands, for example, thyroid gland and kidney tubules, which absorb and secrete substances from and into the urine. Simple columnar epithelium mostly absorbs. It also can produce mucus and certain enzymes, particularly in the digestive system. So it can be found in the digestive tract. It can be found in the bladder. It can be found in the bronchi. In bronchi and uterine tubes, um, columnar epithelium carries cilia, which either move mucus or in the fallopian or uterine tubes, they move oocytes. Pseudostratified columnar epithelium. If you look at these cells, you may notice that that's a single cell layer. However, nuclei appear like there are two layers of cells. This is why it's called pseudostratified. So it's one layer, but it looks like there are two. It secretes mucus very actively <clears throat> and cilia move mucus, especially if it's a respiratory tract. Okay, so in trachea, they will, cilia will move mucus upwards towards the larynx. Uh, mucus traps different pathogens, so the mucus with the um, pathogens will just um, be swallowed and pathogens will be destroyed in the stomach. Now, there are two types of stratified epithelium that I want you to know. First type is stratified squamous epithelium, 
which lines places with a significant deal of abrasion. You can see here multiple layers of cells, and when abrasion occurs in places like mouth, esophagus, vagina, or skin, the top layer will be destroyed by replication of the cells of the bottom layer will push cells <clears throat> upwards. Now, transitional epithelium is another example of stratified. It's, it's a very specific type of epithelium. It can be found in the bladder, parts of the uh, urethra, and the ureters. And it is a stretchable epithelium that allows those organs to stretch. Now, as we mentioned before, epithelial cells can form glands. Glands can be divided into exo- and endocrine glands. So while endocrine glands secrete substances called hormones into the blood or extracellular fluid, exocrine secretes substances into ducts or lumens. So for instance, thyroid adrenal or pituitary glands, they produce hormones, they produce hormones that are released into the blood. While exocrine glands such as, for instance, parts of the pancreas uh, or parts of the liver, they secrete substances that go into, for instance, intestine, the lumen of intestine. Or sweat glands produce their secretions into a duct, a duct that then goes on the skin. So there are three types of exocrine gland based on the way they secrete substances. Merocrine gland, uh, which can be exemplified by a watery sweat, produces small vesicles, secretory vesicles, which release whatever secretion they contain. Apocrine glands, <coughs> that produce smelly sweat, um, they secrete by pinching off the parts of the cell with all that the cell contains. So there are some molecules that are supposed to be secreted as well as components of the cellular membrane and cytoplasm. And then there are holocrine glands. Example would be a sebaceous gland of the skin. During this secretion process, cells actually die, releasing all its content outside. Now, next type of tissue that we're going to talk about is a connective tissue. As we mentioned before, connective tissue is a binding connecting tissue. It supports, it anchors different body structures, and it's a most common type of the body tissue. This tissue can be classified into proper connective and specialized connective tissue. In proper connective, it can be loose and dense tissue, and in each of this group there are three subtypes. Areolar, adipose and reticular in the loose group, and elastic regular and irregular in the dense, loop, dense group. Among specialized connective tissue, we select bone, blood, bones, and cartilage, which further can be divided into hyaline, elastic, and fibers. So let's look at the main components of a connective tissue itself. Connective tissue consists of matrix and its cellular component. Matrix consists of the ground substance, that's basically that beige stuff here, and fibers. Ground substance is a bunch of uh, proteins, carbohydrates, glycoproteins, in which fibers are suspended. And fibers can be formed by collagen, uh, you can see here thick collagen fibers which are responsible for the mechanical resilience of the um, connective tissue. You can see relatively thin elastic fibers which provide elasticity to the connective tissue. And you can see even thinner reticular fibers, the blue ones, form a mesh, sort of a filtration mesh in the tissue. Now, in terms of the cellular components, we have fibroblasts, some main cells of the connective tissue, which produce 
connective tissue matrix. Then we have mesenchymal cells, which essentially serve as the stem cells that can develop into fibroblasts. And we have a separate population of cells, macrophages. Um, on this image that here, macrophages protect against infections. I would expand this saying that it's not only macrophages, but it generally white blood cells. So we're going to start talking about uh, a loose connective tissue first. So we have loose connective tissue proper, that's the full name. There are three types of loose connective tissue. Areolar loose connective tissue is a gel-like matrix with fibroblasts. It contains all kinds of fibers, collagen fibers, these thick red ones, and reticular and elastic fibers. Its main function, that's areolar connective tissue, its main function is to cushion. Okay, uh, can be found under the epithelial tissue in organs like intestines or stomach. Um, it can carry out some inflammatory responses. Then we have adipose tissue. Basically, it's a fat tissue. You can see adipocytes, specialized cells here. Uh, there are fibroblasts. There are very few collagen fibers. Fibers are not common for adipose tissue. It's pretty loose. And the main function of adipose tissue in humans is the fuel storage and to some extent insulation. Um, can be found under the skin commonly, in the breasts, in the abdomen. Um, so, uh, and the last loose connective tissue is reticular. Again, fibroblasts, gel-like matrix. It is characterized by multiple reticular fibers, which form a framework, structural framework, for white blood cells, which can be found in the lymphoid organs. So reticular connective tissue can be found in the spleen and lymph nodes. White blood cells basically cling to that reticular mesh. This mesh contains pathogens that are going through the lymphatic system so that white blood cells can mount a proper response against those pathogens. So dense connective tissue proper that's our next topic. Uh, elastic dense connective tissue proper um, contains a lot of elastic fibers and collagen fibers. It can uh, recoil after it is being stretched. Uh, you can find this elastic in uh, uh, connective dense elastic connective tissue, the walls of stretchable organs like aorta arteries uh, or bronchi so that organs can stretch and recoil. Regular dense connective tissue proper. Uh, also, fibroblasts are the main cells. A lot of collagen fibers. Those are nuclei. Uh, very few collagen, uh, very few elastic fibers, mostly collagen. It is resistant to a tensile stress in one direction. Attaches bones to bones and muscles to bones, bones to bones through ligaments and muscle through bones to, through tendons. <clears throat> um, and now dense irregular connective tissue proper here has a lot of collagen fibers and it can resist the tension forces that are applied in various directions because collagen fibers are oriented in different directions. It can be found in uh, capsules, fibrous capsules of joints, organs, and in the dermis of human skin. A few details of specialized connective tissue. First is going to be cartilage. There are three types of cartilage, hyaline, elastic, and fibrous, and you can see hyaline on the left. It's a pretty firm matrix with special cells shown here, the chondrocytes contains a lot of collagen fibers and uh, the function of hyaline cartilage is the resistance against compression it supports. Um, it forms nasal cartilage, walls of trachea, 
covers ends of long bones, attaches your ribs to your sternum. Elastic cartilage shown here contains plenty of elastic fibers, these dark ones. Provides not only support, but also flexibility, elasticity. Can be found in both ears and epiglottis, a valve that closes your respiratory passages when you swallow. And then there's fibrous cartilage here, which contains a lot of thick collagen fibers, which um, allow this cartilage to be extremely resilient to compression, to the mechanical pressure, can be found in the places where such mechanical pressure is particularly um, strong and, and massive. We're talking about pubic symphysis between coxal bones, intervertebral discs, and knee menisci. A couple more specialized connective tissues, bone and blood. So bone matrix is solid because of the hydroxyapatite mineral. Special cells called osteocytes can be found in the lacunae of osteons. And obviously the function of the bone is storage of minerals, protection, support, movement, uh, and generation of blood. And it's found in the skeleton. Blood is a liquid connective tissue with a liquid matrix, no fibers whatsoever. And main cells are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. The function of blood is to connect basically different parts of the body together by transporting respiratory gases and nutrients across the body. Now we're moving on to the muscle tissue. There are three types of muscle tissue, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. So skeletal muscle is under voluntary conscious control. Its cells are long, non-branched, straight, with multiple nuclei. The cells are striated, you can see the stripes here, uh, which reflects the internal structure of each cell. It can be controlled only by the nervous stimulus, and functionally it is responsible for voluntary conscious movements. Okay. It also generates a significant amount of heat when we work out or just move. Cardiac muscle here in the middle is entirely under involuntary unconscious control. Its cells are branched. Usually there is one nucleus in rare cases too. Um, I need to correct myself. This muscle is striated. You can see striations right here. Okay. It is striated. Um, and it can be controlled by nervous signals, chemical, hormonal, and mechanical stimuli. It can be found only in the heart, and its function is to pump blood. Now, smooth muscle, with its uninucleated, spindle-shaped cells, is under involuntary, unconscious control. It does not have any striations. It also can be controlled by nervous stimuli, chemical, hormonal, or mechanical stimuli, and it's important for First of all, peristalsis, uh, movement, propulsion of, of nutrients, for instance, of food through the digestive tract, dilation and constriction of blood vessels, dilation and constriction of pupils, <clears throat> change of shape of the lenses in the eye. Uh, it is mostly found in the walls of the hollow organs, of course, such as blood vessels and alimentary tract. Nervous tissue. So neurons are excitable cells. They play the major role in transmitting information, communication between different parts of the body. <clears throat> and then there are neuroglial cells. Neuroglia provide support for uh, neurons. Here you can see a neuron and those uh, dark dots are the nuclei of neuroglial cells. They support Neurons provide electrical insulation to neurons, protect them against microorganisms, make sure that the uh, concentration of electrolytes are proper. Uh, now, uh, there are... So, where can you find nervous tissue? In the central and peripheral nervous system. So, central nervous system, brain, brain stem, spinal cord. These neurons 
integrate information after they receive it. Peripheral nervous system, receptors, sensory receptors, like mechanoreceptors, touch receptors in your skin, and nerves that communicate signals from sensory receptors, for instance, to CNS, and commands from, so sensory nerves, communicate sensory messages from sensory receptors to the CNS, while motor nerves communicate motor impulses from the CNS, just brain spinal cord, to the muscles and glands for producing certain effects to the effectors for movement or secretion. Now let's quickly overview main body systems. So lymphatic system is responsible for the immune protection. Um, it defends against pathogens and also returns fluids from tissues to blood. Um, so respiratory system provides the site of a gas exchange between the blood and the air. It removes carbon dioxide from the body and delivers oxygen to the blood. Digestive system is responsible for the digestion of food allows us to absorb nutrients into the blood and excrete wastes. Urinary system allows us to control the electrolyte concentrations, the concentrations of acids and bases. It removes the waste from the blood by filtering it and excretes excess water, chemicals and or drugs. Now, reproductive system, well, it allows us to reproduce. Male reproductive system produces male sex hormones and male gametes, while the female reproductive system produces female sex hormones and female gametes. And then after the fertilization, it supports the development of embryo and fetus until birth, it carries out the birth, and then provides milk for feeding an infant. Integumentary system or skin. It covers internal body structures, uh, providing us protection. Also allows us some identification of other people. And let's not forget that skin is critical in the regulation of the body temperature, you know, via sweating. Now, skeletal system supports the body and together with the muscular system uh, allows us to move structures like rib cage and cranium provide protection to vital organs muscular system is key in executing uh, movements together with the skeletal system and it also provides heat to maintain proper body temperature now nervous system here that consists of the brain spinal cord and peripheral nerves it processes the signals, detects the signals, processes them, uh, formulates the responses, and in general controls human organs. And then we have endocrine system, which function is to produce hormones and regulate bodily functions, uh, somewhat similar to what nervous system does, but all the regulations of endocrine system are absolutely out of our conscious control. And finally, cardiovascular system is responsible for transport and delivering delivery of oxygen and nutrients to the tissues and carrying out oxygen and wastes from the tissues to the lungs. It also is important in the temperature regulation by dumping the excessive heat when subcutaneous vessels are vasodilating. For the last piece, we're going to talk about anatomical planes and anatomical terminology, and I explain what I expect from you. So, um, this is these are three planes that you must know. First is going to be a sagittal plane which separates the body onto the right and left parts. Left is sinister, Dexter is right, 
portions. All other planes um, here, uh, all other sagittal planes are parallel to mid sagittal plane. Okay. So um, the directional terminology associated with the mid sagittal plane is medial and lateral. Closer to the midline is medial, farther from the midline is lateral. For instance, your ears are lateral to your nose, while your navel, your umbilicus, is medial to your hips. Transverse plane here separates the body into the superior and inferior or cranial and caudal portions. And the terminology for superior and inferior would be like this. Your head is superior to your chest or your abdomen is inferior to your chest. A coronal plane separates your body into a dorsal and ventral portions. Uh, dorsal meaning uh, uh, in the back, ventral meaning in the front, and other terms a posterior and anterior, posterior and dorsal are synonyms, and anterior and ventral are synonyms. So the terms that you use is ventral to something or dorsal to something. So if you look at this image here, the nose is ventral to the back of your head, okay? Or your navel, your umbilicus here, or let's put it this way, genitalia are ventral to the buttocks, okay? So that's that's how that's how ventral um, dorsal works. Now another terminology that we we don't really see here, and I'm going to remove all this, going to erase all the ink on the slide. Another term that uh, we use is proximal and distal. So farther from the point of attachment is distal, closer to the point of attachment is proximal. Your palms are distal to your elbows. Your knees are proximal to your feet. Now this can look uh, pretty pretty uh, dramatic here. Those are body regions. Uh, I have no intention of going through that slide and just name them uh, painfully over and over. I will publish the study guide. It will be on the blackboard with the anatomical regions that you need to know. I can ask anything from the list that will be published on the blackboard, not more. If anything is not on that list, it will not be on the exam. So my suggestion, uh, when you study this, identify the region, let's say you start with the leg and start memorizing the regions of the leg, pedal, femoral, um, patellar, crural, tarsal, um, popliteal, and so on and so forth. Then you move on to, say, an arm, and you go brachial, anti-brachial, anti-cubital, carpal, palmar, so on and so forth. So you eat it in the small beats, okay? Um, leg, then arm, then trunk, then hand. This way, you will not get overwhelmed, and by going through this several times, you will memorize it pretty well. <clears throat> now, body cavities. So, um, we have ventral and dorsal aspects, or ventral and dorsal body cavity. So, ventral body cavity incorporates thoracic and abdominal pelvic. Thoracic cavity can be further divided into left and right pleural cavities pericardial cavity, and superior mediastinal cavity. Abdominal pelvic cavity can be divided into abdominal and pelvic. So which organs can be found where? So pelvic cavity, distal colon, rectum, your urinary bladder, and all reproductive organs. Abdominal cavity, kidneys, small intestines, spleen, stomach, liver, gallbladder. Plural cavities here. Plural cavity. Lungs. Right lung in the right plural, left lung in the left plural. Pericardial cavity. Heart. 
mediastinal cavity. Esophagus goes through it, trachea, there's a thymus there. Now, in terms of dorsal cavity, it can be further separated into the cranial and vertebral. So cranial cavity here, it contains the brain, while the vertebral cavity contains the spinal cord. Now, you do need to have a general understanding of which organs are where. It's all in the study guide. Um, that's the reason why it's called a guide. So fill it out, upload it, and you're going to feel pretty confident when time comes for the quiz.